Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. Uh, Tom alluded to the issue of the, the wrath of God and being poured out and uh, what's going to come at the, the end times. And that's where we find ourselves in Romans chapter, no, uh, Romans chapter number one. So let's read a few verses and I want to say a few comments and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the study. So Romans chapter number one, let's look at uh, verse number <clears throat> 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we're, we're dealing with the issue of Paul being ready to preach the gospel. We're talking about some of the specifics of what he's talking here about what the gospel is. And uh, as we go down, I just want you to understand the issue that... Paul is telling what the gospel is first, or he, he's going to tell you about the gospel and how it's the power of God. But then what's the very next thing that he gets into? You notice the very next thing that he, doesn't get, that he gets into, he doesn't immediately go over to Romans chapter number 4 and deal with the issue of uh, justification or uh, you know Romans 4 or 5. Or, what he does then is he then reminds you of why you need the gospel. He reminds you of why the good news is necessary. He reminds you of the state that you were in, the state of, an, of, of a lost person. What you see, when you're in unrighteousness, what is the problem that you have? The problem is, is that if you've not been made right with God, the wrath of God is going to be poured out against unrighteousness. And so you need to realize Paul wants you to realize why the gospel is important. You know, you may be, as a, as a lost sinner, they may have been in a situation where, yeah, uh, I know I haven't trusted this gospel, but so what? So what? You, you know the attitude of people, right? Yeah, so what? Well, Paul tells you what. He tells them that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and uh, unrighteousness of men. So you need righteousness. You need to be right. How do you become right? How does one become right? You can't make yourself right. So that's where God comes in. But he says in verse number 16, where he's talking about that he, the gospel of Christ and how it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We've dealt with those points. But he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, why make the distinction here? Uh, you know, obviously there are some dispensational distinctions in your Bible. There is a difference between Israel and the body of Christ. Um, in verse number 14, it was the Gentile division between the Greeks and the barbarians. And now in verse number 16, it's a dispensational division between the Jews and the Greeks. But what does this reference to Jew and Greek mean? What, why, why does Paul say to the Jew first and also to the Greek? Um, so th throw out three things to you. So first, uh, what does that mean? Well, it could mean that in the gospel of grace, the Jew comes first. Does that sound right? No. It could be that in the gospel of grace, Paul would go to the Jew first. And it could mean that a gospel went to the Jews first and then a gospel went to the Gentiles, uh, you know, uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I, I think what you find is that number three is the correct position. What, what Paul is saying is that when, when Christ preached to the Jew, then the Jew was able to get saved. It's the power of God uh, 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 to everyone that believes. When Christ is preached to the Jew or to the Greek and they believe, both are saved, right? This verse is a, is a reference, I think, to the, the, the historical 
fact or the, the, the issue of the gospel going out, not to, not to Paul's commission in the dispensation of grace. So meaning that it's not a statement about what Paul's priority is. Paul doesn't always have to go to the, to the Jew, and the Jew takes first place under the dispensation of grace. No, it's, it's a statement rather about the equality, both of the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew, you're going to find out when we go over into Romans chapter 2, the Jew doesn't have a privileged position today. So there's a lot of Christianity that talks about how... Um, you know, we need to take care of Israel and we need to get Jews back to the homeland. And so they play all kinds of commercials on Christian TV for you to pay to get, uh, you know, Russian Orthodox Jews uh, a plane ticket to get back to Jerusalem uh, because you need to bless Israel. Well, that's not what God is doing today. Um, and so anyways, the Jew doesn't hold the privileged position. It's not talking about uh, the commission, the order of evangelizing in the dispensation of grace. Paul is referencing the dispensational position that the nation of Israel, I think, has had up to this time. Mark chapter number 7. Go back to Mark chapter number 7. Always hold your place in Romans chapter 1. So that way we can quickly flip back to it. But I'd like you to go to Mark 7. And I just want you to see distinctions that are made, that Paul is saying, it's not there. <laughs> it's not there. In Mark chapter number 7 and verse number 25, Mark seven twenty-five. the Word of God says, For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. This woman, not a Jew, who was Christ sent to? Christ was, he said in Matthew chapter 15, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I'm not sent but unto Israel. So Mark chapter number 7 makes a very clear distinction in verse number 26 that this woman was a Greek. She was not a Jew. She was a Greek. That's why this passage is important. Because the woman heard of Christ, and she comes to Christ, she heard of Him, and comes to Him. What, did, what was her desire? What did she want? Did she want gold, silver, precious stones? Lord, please make me wealthy. Please make me powerful. She had an unselfish request for her daughter, which had an unclean spirit. Now, if this woman was a Jew and she came to Christ with this faith that, hey, I've heard of him, I'm going to come and fall at his feet, Christ's response would have been different. But because this woman was a Greek, what did Jesus say unto her? Let the children be filled first. Who is Christ referring to? The Jew. What did Paul say in Romans chapter number one? The Jew first and also the Greek. And here he's speaking to the Greek woman and he, he says, Let the children be filled first, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. He's conveying to this Greek woman that your time has not yet come. I've come to Israel. I've come to, to take care of the house of Israel. And it's not your time. And Christ wasn't up to this point, he wasn't going to take care of it, right? He, he wasn't going to, 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 to resolve her request. And then if he didn't do that, what would you be left thinking? Wow, Christ, that was really unmerciful of you. <laughs> that, was, that was really tough to call the woman a dog and send her off with her daughter suffering. But notice what she said. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. 
<laughs> she acknowledged Israel's place and Christ's ministry to Israel. She, she acknowledged that. And when she acknowledged Israel first, and she said, yet the dogs under the, under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Lord, I'm not trying to take you away from your ministry. I know you've come to the nation of Israel. That is your ministry. I'm a Gentile. I have no right to be blessed. But even us dogs, we get the overflow from the master's table. The crumbs that fall off and we're able to lick them up. Lord, can I have a crumb? Something that I'm not worthy of. I'm acknowledging my position as a Greek. And the Lord said unto her, go thy way. Notice what he says. For this saying, go thy way. Because she acknowledged the ministry that, that the Jew first and then unto the Greek, go thy way. Um, now, I'm, I'm superimposing what Paul said back onto this, right? It's not like Christ came and said, I'm going to come to the Jews first and, and, and then we're going to go to the Greeks. And he came out and he, he told them what, they, what Paul was, he was going to call a man one day and I'm going to send them out to the Gentiles. That's not what happened. Obviously, dispensationally speaking, we know that God's plan was always to bless the Gentiles, but through, through, through the nation of Israel was how it was going to happen. Turn over to Acts chapter number three. I want to take a look at another passage, Acts chapter number three. So on the timeline, if you're thinking about Acts chapter number three, this is when after Christ has been crucified, after he's resurrected, and after his resurrected ministry, uh, some think that, okay, now the distinction is gone. E even the dispensationalists who say that, yes, there's a difference between Israel and the body of Christ, they think everything changed after the cross and that now they were going to everybody. Uh, Acts chapter number three, let's look at a few things. Um, Acts chapter 3, look at verse number 25. Um, I, I like verse number 24. That's not my point. So we're going to start reading in verse 24 because I like it. And I'm the one that's up here, right? So I can determine which verse we start with. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. I remember trying to understand the book of Acts and what was going on here. And Acts 3.24 was very helpful to me because I know that when he says, and all the prophets from Samuel, I know that from Samuel, what started with Samuel was a king. When you go back in the Old Testament and you read Samuel, Samuel's the one who anointed Saul, and then he's the one who anoints David. And, and, and what did God promise to David? A throne forever. And all, what is it that all of the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after have, have, have spoken of? They foretold of Israel's kingdom. Not a kingdom for all the nations of the world. <laughs> Not a kingdom for, for everybody to partake of. And we're just today trying to build up God's kingdom upon this earth all across the globe. That's not the plan. <laughs> The plan was for Israel to have a nation, a land, a nation, a people, and a kingdom with a throne sitting in Jerusalem. Very specific. Very specific. Verse number 25. What do the twelve apostles and Peter say to the people that they're speaking to in Acts? Verse 25. Ye are the children of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So what I'm saying is over in Romans chapter number one, when Paul says the Jew first and also the Greek, what I'm, what I'm saying is I think this is a reference to the historical fact of how God came. He came to Israel, he came to the Jew first, and as Peter says, unto you first, God. He's speaking to Israel here. He's not speaking to all the people of the world. He's not speaking to the Gentiles. When he says in verse number 25, ye are the children of the prophets, he's speaking to Israel. Just like when Christ told the Greek woman that I've come to the children, right? The children of Israel are the ones who are to be blessed. They're the ones that are to get the blessing first. So this is having to do with Israel's special 
position that they held. And the church today, looking at the issue between the Jew and the Greek and the, the issue between Israel and the Gentile, they either ignore the distinctions or they say we have become Israel. They completely do away with the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. And Romans will show us that that is not the case, nor is it God's purpose. It's not God's purpose to do away with his plan and purpose for Israel. He's not done with them completely. He will return unto them. He's done. He set them aside for a time. Uh, you know what? Go over to Acts chapter number 13. One more point. Acts chapter number 13. Now, for you Bible students, what's going on in Acts chapter number 13? So the Lord Jesus Christ comes in his earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He comes to the nation of Israel. Uh, John the Baptist, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You need to repent for the kingdom is at hand. And they're going to water bab be water baptized. They're going to believe that Christ is the Messiah. He is crucified. He's buried. He's risen. Peter goes out in the early part of Acts and he, he's preaching to Israel. And he tells them that you need to repent and be water baptized in order to get the forgiveness of sins. And you come over and you have Stephen preaching to the leaders of the nation of Israel in Acts chapter number seven. And he's testifying unto them about how they're stiff necked and how they've always rejected what those prophets said. You know, over in Acts chapter number three, when it says, ye are the children of the prophets, they rejected what the prophets said. So much so that they didn't just reject them. They weren't just apathetic towards the prophets. They hated the prophets and killed them. <laughs> and that's what Stephen told the leaders of Israel. And so what did they do to Stephen? They killed Stephen, just like they killed the prophets. <laughs> Stephen's like, thank you for proving my point. I'm sure he wasn't saying thank you as he was being uh, you know, killed there. But um, so then what does God do? Does God, the, Israel rejects their Messiah. What, what is he left to do? What God does is he comes over and he saves a man named Saul, says, you're going to be Paul and I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. And he starts, Paul starts this ministry that's going on from Acts 9 to 13. There's a bit of a transition here. God shows to Peter what he's going to be doing. And in Acts chapter 13, Paul goes out and preaches. Now, what is Paul? What is Saul? He's a Jew. So where does he go first when he starts preaching? He goes into the synagogues. And what does he say? Acts chapter number 13, let's look at verse number 44. Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Oh, what a... Wouldn't you long for that? Wouldn't you long for this Sunday? The whole city of Warren came out to hear the word of God. Is it different times? Are we not, are we not preaching a, 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 a seeker-friendly message that's friendly enough to get all the people out? Paul, on the next Sabbath, Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Isn't that a history lesson for you right there? Here, Paul is going to be preaching God's goodness available to all people. And when the Jews see it, do they rejoice? They don't rejoice. They want to keep it for themselves. We're the seed of Abraham. We're the sons of the prophets. We're the sons of the fathers. What are these no good dogs, these Gentiles, what do they have any business partaking of our benefits for? They were filled with envy. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Why did they speak against those things that Paul spoke of? They were filled with envy and they let their emotions guide their thinking process and they spoke out against what Paul was saying. 
not because Paul was false, not because they could prove Paul wrong, but because their wicked hearts didn't like that he was sharing good news with Gentile dogs. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. <laughs> I mean, don't take these words for granted. Can you imagine Paul and Barnabas? The whole city has come out. They're saying words, and these Jews don't like it one bit. Well, maybe we should water it down a little bit. Maybe we should kind of, hey, Paul, you know, you're a little blunt. Maybe you should just uh, rein it back in a little bit. No. They waxed bold and said, you want to stoke a fire? This is how you stoke a fire. Paul said, it was necessary that the word of God should first, remember Romans 1, 16, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, and he's saying here, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now how can you get mad at that, right? He puts it all on them. You're judging yourselves unworthy. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think you've put it from yourselves you don't even think you're worthy of everlasting life, so we will turn to the Gentiles. It's all your fault. <laughs> For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. You see, the fall of Israel there is both, a, there's a sudden aspect to it, and there's a gradual aspect to it. And what I mean by that is there's a sudden aspect in the fact that once Paul is called and sent, the commission has taken place for Paul to go. The, 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 the gospel of the grace of God be preached. But you see Israel's declining. There's a, you know, when, when Peter is preaching their ministry, they're not, those circumcision believers do not go out proselytizing like Paul does. That's a, different message for another time, but as Israel's ministry declines, you don't, why is it declining? Is it because Peter's not a good evangelizer like Paul? No. It's because Peter's to stay put in Jerusalem along and, and to minister to, to those circumcision believers who have not, who are not part of the dispensation of grace. They're, the 12 apostles don't have Paul's ministry to go to the whole world and preach the gospel of the grace of God. There's a difference in your Bible. So it happens with the calling and the sending of the Apostle Paul, but Israel's kingdom program, uh, Christ's earthly ministry, there's a remnant through the book of Acts. That's why we call Acts a, a transitionary book. During that transi transition period, you find Paul doing things such as baptizing people, and, 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 and then there's, there's some tongues and and you have the issue of meat being sacrificed to idols, but that, that issue is no longer uh, an issue. Israel's not around and operating. Go back to Romans chapter number one. <clears throat> so he says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the gospel of Christ is the good news about Christ. You guys know the gospel, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Um, how that Christ died for our sins, and He was buried, and then He rose, rose again the third day. You trust that Christ died for your sins, and He'll save you from your sins. There's the good news. There's the gospel in a nutshell that'll get your sins forgiven. The wrath of You get Christ's imputed righteousness to your account. You know it's no longer about your works. They're the wrath of, you're not in threat of the wrath of God being poured out. But the good news of Christ, everything that's contained within the gospel of Christ, I mean, it's a treasure trove. It's a treasure box. You just keep pulling out the goodness, right? And so we can... We can contain the, the, the gospel into words whereby when we convey it, uh, they have the ability to save someone from their sins. Not us, not our words, but what Christ accomplished and when they trust what Christ did through what God revealed. But what is the mechanism? 
So you, you, when it says that, that the, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, what is the mechanism by which the power of God is disseminated? How does the power of God, which is contained in the gospel, get spread, right? You have a power line that comes into your house, right? You have a power box. Uh, well, some of us do. My dad grew up without electricity. Um, most of us have electricity now. You've got a little power box. How is it that that power gets disseminated? Well, there's little electrical cables that run through your house. And when you want the power to go somewhere, you flip the switch, right? And boom, the power goes up to your light bulbs and it turns the light on. You want to turn the power off, flip the switch back down and the power is cut off. How does the power get disseminated that rests in the gospel of Christ? Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Very next book in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. The way that the power of the gospel of Christ gets disseminated is by preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of what? Preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man, stronger than men. So Paul says in verse number 18 that the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is what? The power of God. How does the power of God get disseminated? God conveyed his words in a book. Now, you know, you go to the store, you can buy a little card. It was Valentine's Day, and maybe you got your, your you know, wife or, or girlfriend a card that said, you know, Happy Valentine's Day, I love you. And if you didn't, then you're in trouble now. But uh, some of the, the cards that you get, you can open it, and then it'll talk to you, right? It has the audible thing. Well, God has chosen to preserve his word in a book where the text is written down on a page. And when, the, when you open up this book here, guess what? It doesn't speak. You know, it doesn't have a little battery in it. It's not audible. It doesn't come out at, at you. The way that the, the power of the gospel of Christ and that, that gospel is, 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 is disseminated to people is through the preaching of God's word. The preaching of God's word is not relegated to a pulpit where someone stands up into a pulpit and preaches every Sunday morning, and then we get people who stand up there and preach, and we call them preachers, right? The only people who preach are not the people who, you know, are standing behind that wooden box up there that we call a pulpit. Joyce goes out to a, a birthday party with her aunt, which is not her real aunt, but she calls her aunt, <laughs> and preaches to her aunt the truth of the gospel. You see, we all have a ministry. We've all called, been called to be ambassadors. And the way that power of the gospel is disseminated to other people is when you preach the gospel, you're turning the light switch on. And now the power is flowing, and whether or not their light bulb turns on is up to them. But the juice is being run to the light bulb. They make the decision. You're confronting them with the power of the gospel of Christ, which Paul says over in 1 Corinthians, it's not by wisdom of words. 
We don't try to get up here and wax eloquent just so we can tickle your ears and make you think that we're smart and we have an expanded vocabulary, right? We don't pick people to put behind the pulpit, the ones who have the best vocabulary, know the longest words, and have the, you know, the most uh, average syllables per word spoken. We put the people behind the pulpit who want to have an interest in studying God's Word and have an interest for the people, and they want to preach God's Word up there. But that's not where it stops. It, it continues in, in all of us. The church, the body of Christ, it doesn't sit there and say that only your preacher is to preach. You know, Paul, <laughs> there used to be, uh, I, I got the connotation in my previous life that the plan was try to get as many people as you can into church on Sunday, try to get all the lost in, and then the gospel is just preached every Sunday to them, right? And it's the same thing every Sunday. Preach the gospel to the lost, and for the saved people, put them under condemnation because they haven't been acting right and tell them to get up to the altar and they need to get right with God. And then just put that on repeat. Um, and then you don't even preach the right gospel. But that's a whole other issue. Not going to get into that. <laughs> uh, my point being is that when the truth is, is, is shared here, we're a body. We're a local manifestation of the body of Christ. We, we are in this together. <laughs> And then we mature together in God's word. And then guess what? You go out and share it with your friends and with your family and with your co-workers. And, and it's not Tom's responsibility for you to bring your friends and family to Tom and say, Tom, you preach the gospel to them. <laughs> Tom, you get them saved. Or let's make sure, by the way, it's not a bad thing to get your friends and family into the church on Sundays. I'm just saying that when you approach the scripture, you don't find the strategy saying, okay, listen, body of Christ, everybody just try to get as many people into the church building and you have that one preacher that we designate and you have them preach the gospel to them. That's not the way it works. There's an accountability on each and every one of us. So the way that the power of the gospel of Christ is disseminated is by preaching. You get people saved by preaching the gospel. If you don't preach the gospel, people aren't going to get saved. Because if they don't hear the gospel, they don't know the gospel, they're not going to have an opportunity to believe the gospel. So we, we preach Christ crucified, not as shame, not as his defeat, uh, but as his ultimate triumph and our ultimate triumph. Uh, through his death, he defeated sin and death and the power of the adversary, the, the power that he holds over each and every one of us. And it's the most beautiful and the most exquisite love story that you'll ever find, right? Don't waste your time buying the Harlequin Presents or, or whatever it used to be. You know, or, um, the best love story that you'll ever find is in the Bible. If you're a, a man and you like to read and you like, uh, you know, you like uh, some good action stories and, and war and, and things like that, the Bible's your book. <laughs> and if you're a lady and you like a, 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 a relationships and love stories, and the Bible is your book. <laughs> it's so beautiful. The love because... You have someone who was completely innocent, voluntarily dying for the guilty, which he loved in order to redeem them. Isn't that the best love story? Redemption? The gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news of what was accomplished, is, all, is the only good news that has the power to save a lost sinner. So we must preach the gospel, yes, but we must preach the right gospel. It's not enough just to love someone else and want them to be saved. And you share something with them that's not the right gospel. Just because you have the right intentions doesn't mean that they're going to be saved. Telling someone, you need to invite Jesus into your heart has no ability to save them because they'll still, still be lost in their sins because they're not going to put their faith in the fact that Christ has died for their sins. So when we preach the gospel, we're, we need to be clear that you're a sinner 
and the, the penalties of your sin is death. But the good news is that Christ came and took your place and died the death that you uh, lawfully should be dying. And he died for you and he saved you from your sins. If you trust that he saved you from your sins, he'll save you and you'll have eternal life. But anything other than that, well, you know, you go to church, uh, you know, you understand the point. Preach the right gospel. And we should preach the gospel in a way that people know they need this good news. That it is vital. That it is so vital, it is like they're getting ready to cross a vast desert. And this is the water that they so desperately need to get them through their journey. You know, when we, when we preach the gospel, we should realize the power of the thing in which we're holding, right? Look over at Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5. I ended last week saying I knew I had a note somewhere down in my notes that was on my mind at the time. And I said, I'll share it with you next week. It's just a simple thought. Um, but you may recall, um, I just shared this statement when we ended last week. Luke chapter number 5. And I, and I said, when you think about the, the power of the cross and the love that Christ has shared with us, what's a greater expression of power? Is a greater expression of power that God created dirt? and he created everything. I mean, I'm, that, is a, that is very powerful, right? When you go back and read Genesis, when you stand there on a sunset and you stand back and you just look at the sun setting and how beautiful it is and how marvelous it is, how big the sun is up in the sky, and you say, wow, how does that thing just hang there on nothing? <laughs> That's very powerful. But is it more powerful to create dirt or is it more powerful to save a sinner from their sins? Someone who is not right, someone who has sinned and transgressed God's righteousness, and take that transgressor, wash their sins as white as snow, and make them right before God. Which one's more powerful? Look at Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by. So Christ is teaching and these Pharisees came. The Pharisees, they don't like Christ, you know. Um, but they're the Bible teachers of the day. And so they have some doctors of the law sitting by. So these people know the law, right? Which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a, uh, in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, so these people have have a, a friend who is sick and they're carrying him in a bed and they want to bring him to Jesus for Jesus to heal him. But the great multitude around Jesus doesn't, it prevents them from, from taking their friend. I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm impressed by the faith of these people that know if I just get my friend on this bed to Jesus, he'll be, he'll be good. He'll be healed. Uh, in the middle of verse 19 there, they, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, what, had, what, what was this man's bigger problem? His physical condition or his spiritual condition? Well, the biggest problem that you face is your spiritual condition, not your physical condition. If your body, if your health is taken from you and your life is taken from you, if your spiritual condition is fine, you've got eternal life waiting for you. And the body that you're going to get on the other side is much better than the one that you have now. 
So he says that thy sins are forgiven thee. Verse 21, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Ah, you're on the right track. You're on the right track, Pharisees. If you would have just stuck with that line of reasoning. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon the earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. You notice that that man who was sick of the palsy, what, what happens when you're lame for years? What happens to the muscles in your body? They break down, they erode, right? So when, when Christ told him to arise and walk, it would have been hard enough just for these muscles to support the weight of this man's body, right? To walk. But just to show you that when Christ heals a man, he heals him perfectly. <laughs> when Christ heals you, you don't have to go back to rehab to build up the strength in your leg muscles. He healed the man and he said, take up thy couch and go. This man didn't have enough, he didn't only have enough strength in his legs to walk for himself, he had enough strength to pick up some more weight and carry that thing with him. And I guarantee you, I could have jumped on his shoulders and he would have just been just fine walking down the street. Okay, maybe not me. <laughs> maybe one of you smaller ladies. <laughs> but what my point is, is when Christ is saying to them, when he says, whether is, verse 23, whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk, Christ is saying, it's obviously easier for me to, tell, to heal this man's physical condition and say, rise up and walk. It's much harder for me to say thy for sins be forgiven. But just so you know that I have the power to forgive sins, I'll also heal his physical body, which is really nothing for me to do. Just so you know that I have the spiritual power to forgive sins. And so when I think about the, the I, I, I'm, I want to link that back into the power of the gospel of Christ. What's easier for God to do? Create the world, make the dirt, or to save a lost sinner? It's easier for him to create dirt than to save a man from his sins. In Genesis chapter number 1, when God spoke the world into existence, do you find Christ hanging on a cross? Why not? Because it was much easier just to speak the world into existence and have the dirt appear. When Christ wanted to forgive you of your sins, He couldn't just speak it into existence. Why? Because God is just. The justice of the law, the demands of the law had to be met. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. What Christ endured on the cross to pay for our sins was much more difficult for him than in Genesis chapter 1 when he said, let there be light, and there was light. The power that God has displayed through his cross work, through what he suffered, has the ability to save every person on this earth from their sins. There is no such thing as a limited atonement. The efficacy of the blood of Christ, the power of the blood of Christ is available to everyone who would believe. And God has made that way possible for each and every one of us. I, I think most of us here know that and understand that. And so let that be an encouragement to us to share that power with other people because the way that that power is disseminated is through preaching. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the power that you demonstrated. We're thankful that you loved us. We're thankful for all of these things here that we, that we learn in the book of Romans. Uh, just so many basic, wonderful truths that you've 
shared with us, the blessings that we have and the, the things that you've saved us from and, and what you're able to accomplish in each and every one of our lives. Lord, may we not take this life for granted, but may we live it for you, especially in light of all that you've done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.